the proud founder and director of the Parent Education Series here in the Sequoia Union High School District, a program that we founded 14 years ago. So it is a pleasure to be here, and it is really a pleasure to see all of you out tonight, especially on a busy March. I call this March Madness in the Parent Education Series. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I am going to introduce our presenters, but first of all, I wanted to start out by saying hello. Javier is the, well, is the health and wellness coordinator here, Javier Gutierrez. Um, and so Javier directs the health programs here in the Sequoia Union High School District. Also with us tonight, we have two special guests, Pamela Kurtzman, who is the CEO of the Sequoia Healthcare District, and Dr. Karen Lee, who is the director of school health for the Sequoia Healthcare District. This program is funded by the Sequoia Union High School District and the Sequoia Healthcare District, so it's very important to thank them because this is what makes this program possible. So thank you all for coming. All right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit and our two presenters, and then they'll tell you more as we get going. Obviously, this is a very hot topic or you wouldn't all be here tonight. Um, and again, the reason I founded this program was to give parents the education skills and strategies they need to better communicate with their teens. So your homework, because this is school, is to find something tonight that's interesting to go home and talk to your kids about. That's why we're here. So you will have the authentic information to ask questions. It's all about opening up the lines of communication because we know that that is what works with teens and you're gonna hear more about that tonight. All right. Oh. Also, I quickly wanted to call your attention to a couple of events that we have coming up. This Thursday night at Sequoia High School, we have Impact Teen Drivers doing a parent-teen distracted driving workshop. That is an amazing event, potentially life-saving if you have a student driver at your house. It's a great one for families to go to together. I did one time have the parent of a preschooler come. That seemed a little excessive to me, but <laughs> she had the right idea. Okay. Um, also, as you came in tonight, you were handed a very short survey. If you would fill this out and hand it back to us at the end of the night, I guarantee that I read them all. They help us both with reporting to our funders and um, helping us plan for programs for next year. So if you have a comment for me or you want to give me your email address or um, offer suggestions for topics and speakers, that's great too. Okay, here we go. The Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit is a new online resource created by educators and researchers to prevent middle and high school students' use of electronic cigarettes, vapes, including Juul and other pod-based systems, cigarettes, cigars, smokeless tobacco, and hookah. The toolkit is committed to providing free tobacco and nicotine prevention materials to educators directly working with youth. And everything on the TPT website and their trainings are free. They won't say it, but I'll say it for them. Although it's not required, contributions are welcome and appreciated. They are an independent organization, independent nonprofit, is that right? So again, um, they are here tonight, pro bono, so we <coughs> thank them for their generous <coughs> workshop this evening. Okay, Stephen. Stephen Smune is the co-founder and director of curriculum development for the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit. As the former founding head of the Odyssey Middle School, and the way of a middle school, he is completing his 42nd year as an educator. That deserves kudos. Over the course of Steve's career, he has taught at the elementary, high school, and college levels, and published three major books, including Can't Anybody Write Here? His work has been featured in publications including People Magazine, San Francisco Magazine, Runner's World, and other educational publications. Recently, Steve became CEO of Da Vinci Educational Consultants, which provides assessments, trainings, workshops, and lectures in Japan, China, and at Stanford University. Okay, to my left, Richard, is it Ceballos? Ceballos. Ceballos. Richard Ceballos is co-director of the Stanford Prevention Toolkit. He is a graduate of UC Berkeley with a BA in Integrated Biology and a strong interest in empowering people's lives through science. Richard worked at UCSF as a clinical research coordinator, and he led a novel study on vaping in adolescents, which brought him to the toolkit work. As the project coordinator of the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit, he hopes to utilize his professional skills and passion for education to lead the distribution of the toolkit and ensure that its materials are accessible and the most up-to-date for educators. Please join me in a really warm welcome for Stephen and Richard. Well, 
thank you very much. That's the best introduction I've had since yesterday. <laughs> so uh, we're very happy to be here. Uh, we're from Stanford. Uh, Stanford Admissions, that has a whole new term now at this point for us. We're uh, working on that one as well. We'll tell you some worse things about Stanford graduates in just a second. So you're probably going to be asked, why were you here? Either when you get home or tomorrow, why you took time out of your day to do this. And we like to feel that you'll be able to say you are concerned with saving the most important natural resource we have, our youth. So that's the purpose of our toolkit, and that's the purpose of what we're doing here today. I'd like to thank the seven men who are here today who got in on special accommodations. I know how that feels because I'm the token old white guy on this particular toolkit. And this is the entire millennium. <laughs> you notice he wears his shirt out and he has very cool shoes. And puts sriracha on his kale salad. I told that joke in Kentucky and they, what's kale? <laughs> Didn't go there. So, um, so uh, we'd like you to stand up and if you'd empty your hands. And if you find a partner and just face them for a minute, we're going to show you. And I have to set this down for a second. Don't worry, I have this mic right here. Okay. So if you count to three, you can actually do this activity. Uh, anyone challenged on that at, at this point? Okay, we'll try this. So it's very simple. It just goes like this. One. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. Simple. Go ahead. I want you to know that this person right here was absolutely perfect on that activity. Do you have a partner? Two. Not right. No. She doesn't have a partner. Okay, so now it gets a little more difficult. It goes like this. One, three. One, three. One, three. One. Yeah, he cheats. He gets that extra in there. So it's one, and it's not one, two. It's one. Okay. All right. Go. Try that. parenting. My other area of research right now at Stanford is the cell phone. So I always take a few minutes to get on my soapbox and talk about that particular addiction. 
Okay. This is not parenting either. When both of you have a device, that's not parenting. What we have in this country is a tremendous amount of people who want to bubble wrap their kids. They don't want them to face any adversity. Stanford admissions policy. <laughs> Same kind of thing. The parents who think that I will be determined a very good parent if I have very good kids. There's not a manual on that. And you don't want perfect kids because you aren't perfect as well. So if you're not letting your child deal with adversity, you're really cheating them. All of those parents who did that about admissions to Ivy League schools, basically what they told your kid, you're stupid, you can't get into a good college, I will do this for you. So hopefully they're going to go to college with them. <laughs> Mom, can I ask you a question? Sure, you're going to tell me what's on your mind. This is what's on a teenager's mind. <laughs> no, I'd just rather ask my question. So this is why those moments when you actually get to talk to a teen is really critical. And we're gonna give you a few ideas later about some tricks to do that kind of talking. Okay, so we wanna check in. The way we are, are gonna do this, you want me to do this? Um, yeah, sure. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> We don't know what we're doing all the time. So we're gonna make this side of the room myth and this side of the room fact, okay? So what we want you to do, we're gonna ask you some questions. Is that okay? Sure. Oh, back there. No, it's not okay. Gonna You're gonna move. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna ask you some questions. If you think it's a myth, go to this side. Is that right? You'll, you'll yes, see I'm on the slide, and also if you're unsure, there's a sort of middle spot. So yeah, you if you're stand. unsure, you can stand in the aisle here. Okay, one jewel pot is equal to the amount of nicotine found in one pack of cigarettes. If you think that's a fact, go to one side of the room, just stand. Everybody stand up. Can you say it again with Right there. Oh. Yeah, all the information is on the slide, so we want you to move around and respond to whether you think this is. I know for some of you, um, if you're looking at that slide, it's a little confusing, but we want you to focus on this one. So this side of the room would be myth. And you don't have to move far, you can just stay right where you're seated if you think that's what it is. We just wanted to do a quick poll to see what you knew. <laughs> okay, now look around and see who's here. It's a myth. Oh my goodness. It's a myth, and we'll tell you more about that. Now, all the people that are over here, is it more or less? More or less. Okay, come to this side. Ready to go again? Here's the second one. Altria agreed to give Jewel top shelf space so Jewel pods are displayed alongside Altria's Marlboro cigarettes. True or false? If you don't know, don't care, don't know, middle. Very good question. It was set up here. I don't even know what Alteria is. Does anyone know Alteria? No. It's the maker of Marlboro cigarettes. They just signed an agreement together. So if you are of that philosophy, follow the money, that should tell you that this is a fact. Okay, one more. These cigarettes are like combustible cigarettes, except they deliver less harmful chemicals such as tar and other toxins. Fact or myth? Oh, not so sure of movement on this one, huh? Yeah, just push it out of the way. She's in the this is a myth. Okay, you may sit down. So if some of you are interested in knowing more about the answers to those questions, I'm hoping to answer them today. I'll give you a little more background on that. So some of you may have children in high schools or in middle schools that no longer have doors on their bathroom, and this is why. So the right side says, actually use the bathroom, or do I want to just go in there and jewel? And the sophomores are, jeez, oh, decision making. And the real answer is, these are the kids who actually have to pee, and these are the kids who are actually jeweling in the bathroom. 
So some of you in this room may remember in high school when you walked into the bathroom and there was just a smoke haze over the top of those really rebel, crazy kids who smoked. Now it's Julie. Okay, here are some tobacco nicotine products. Some of them you may be familiar with, some of them you're not familiar with. Take a look at those. If you recognize more than half of them, raise your hand. And how many of you recognize the apple mouse that's on there? <laughs> Nobody, okay. Oh, you do, okay. Because that isn't a mouse. That's actually a pod-based device. A what? A pod-based device. We're going to talk about the difference between vaping and podding or juuling. Okay? So I wanted to add to that by saying that some of these newer products, which you're seeing right here, this, this is where we're at right now with kind of blending in with our everyday tech products. So here are a few examples, and if you were to look at this from a distance or from your periphery, it wouldn't really stand out to you as anything harmful or a tobacco nicotine product. But we're gonna walk you through and show you how the industry is actually um, making it easier for young people to become addicted and for it to be um, hidden under our radar. So kids are not smoking anymore. I need to set this down. Who knows what this is? <laughs> if you look in the rear view mirror and see students in your van, minivan, doing this, you know they're having a pod party. J, U, U, L, Julie. So students across the classroom are going, means we're going to have a pod party later and you get to taste my dragon's blood and I get to taste your banana booger, which happens to be my favorite one. So kids are not smoking cigarettes and those of us who are in this particular business, this has made us relevant again. If you ask a kid today, are you smoking? They assume you're talking about pot because they don't smoke. They jewel. We'd like to point out that a cigarette is a device for delivering nicotine. A jewel or a pod based is a device for delivering nicotine. It's exactly the same. And I wanted to say that some of the terminology we're throwing around, I'm hoping to explore that a little more with you because for you it may be foreign to your ear. You're like, what's pod based? What's jewel? Why is it being used as a verb? What does that mean? Why is there a whole cultural movement around this? So I'm going to break that down for all of you today. Let me ask a question. The, the comment on smoking. So that really, the people smoking, that is, they straight away go to pot. That's what they think you're talking about. Uh, say your question. When well, you said that if you ask a, a child today if they're smoking, uh -huh. that to them means pot. Yes. So and it's not registered as like e-cigarette usage or baby. And the industry's been really smart of like evolving their language so that way someone would even think that it's something else. Like, oh, I'm not smoking, right? But we do know that smoke is smoke in a lot of ways, right? When we go and do our uh, presentations at the school and we ask about smoking, they, a lot of them will say, well, do you mean pot or do you mean cigarette? Because nobody smokes cigarettes anymore as we see that. That line is really down. So we've come to the point, particularly in California, where we've almost eliminated that as a problem, but at the same time, jewel sales are going through the roof. And we'll give you some actual statistics in a bit. If you just go back real quick, Stephen. Sure. The graph you're seeing right here is, was produced by Harvard University. What they're showing is they're projecting how successful these e-cigarette companies are going to be in the future. So right here at the bottom, you'll see that it goes all the way up to 2023. So the cigarette companies, who knows if they'll still be in business, you may have people that are, con con that are going to start using because they're being turned on from e-cigarettes. But this is sort of the future right now. We're really worried about e-cigarette usage among young people. And I see some of you taking pictures of slides. This is going to be on your area that they could go to, right? Yeah, I should say also a big thank you to the team from the Boys and Girls Club and their director, director Jacob Crowell. We are video recording tonight. So it will be available with the slides um, in a few weeks. So from that, the way Richard has said, you can take those slides if you'd like to. You can show them, you can use them as discussion devices, etc. Yeah, you can also watch yourself do the one, two, three, X, two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch that. 
Thank you for coming even though you're late. <laughs> Hi, you're welcome. Can, can you count to three? One, two, three. She was pretty good. Ah. This group had a very difficult time with that activity. Okay. Uh, no tar, or risk of yeast, eggs, bakes, etc. No tar. But nicotine, formaldehyde, a lot of other substances that are in there that Richard's going to talk to you about. Uh, use with cigarettes. What we're finding is Juul is trying to set themselves apart as a cessation device. But what we're finding is that people do both. They smoke cigarettes and they Juul. It becomes a convenience thing. You Juul when... So it, it's a riskier by doing both. We also thought, or <laughs> Juul also put out the idea that there's a lung or cardiovascular disease problem with Juuls. And if you remember how long that took us, uh, I actually used this reference last week and talked about World War II. Richard thought I was talking about the Vietnam War. That's the only war he remembers far enough. <laughs> but people came back from the Second World War addicted to nicotine. Why? They gave them cigarettes for free in their little canteen thing. So lots of guys who didn't smoke started smoking during the war. There was also the myth that it would help you stop eating or not have hungry. Both myths. And think how long it took us to realize, you know what, Surgeon General should file a report and say we ought to put some kind of warning on these. So time is being compressed. Yes, we don't know everything there is to know about the long-term effects of Juul because we haven't had long-term. Mm -hmm. But also I have to point out that these um, points you're seeing right here, um, a lot of them don't apply to Juul yet. So we can have the same concern, but a lot of these earlier devices that we've studied are the first, second, and third generation e-cigarettes. So we're still unraveling what Juul, um, the risks associated with the device. And we're gonna show you some other ones today too, such as Soren, my blue and also fix. They're um, similar to Juul. So the claim of cessation device I talked about, actually what it does is make it harder to quit. It doesn't make it easier, it makes it harder because what you're doing is you're getting a tremendous amount more nicotine and we'll talk about that in a second. So used by, uh, use by youth means that it's more likely that they're gonna go and smoke cigarettes as well. That's frightening that using this device as a social activity is now leading students to actually smoke cigarettes again. So very soon we're going to start to see that rise again. This was a, a study that was done recently of 445 California youth. 52% of her had heard of Juul. Now we think that's tremendously out of date. Have you three all heard of Juul? <coughs> Would you say most of your friends have heard it? And they're in middle school. Now, I think it's probably closer to 80, 90% when you talk about high school students. Okay, the thing that was really interesting about this is uh, participants had, a, uh, they had a predisposition for thinking that Juul was safer than cigarettes. Now, it's only been recent in Juul's, we like to pick on Juul, uh, that Juul's advertising has switched from, oh, it's really cool, to older cigarettes. And we'll show you some examples of the difference among those. And they also had higher <coughs> dependency scores. In other words, they were more likely to be dependent kind of kids. So that they could develop dependencies to other kinds of things as well. So the cost of the Juul. You notice the Juul device, $34.99 to start. <coughs> Now there's ways to get around that, and we were just at a gas station in, God, I don't know where. Oh yeah, we've been traveling a lot. It was in Visalia, <laughs> um, Visalia. so that's in um, yeah. Central California. Yeah. And we saw a 20% off of buy 50. There was a very appealing like promotion that. deal, a promotional deal that we hadn't heard of. But after you get the device, and there's a lot of ways to do that, the pods actually cost less than cigarettes. Now this is not something we like to tell students, because we don't want students to become better consumers. So we often try to, in our lab, we're always discussing, is that a good thing to tell students, or is it a better thing to just tell adults? Or in other words, the industry's making it easier for young people to become addicted, right? It's more accessible in the sense if you have it at a cheaper price. So how many pods do you think Juul sells a month? Just 
ballpark? Four million. Four million. How many? Four? Four million. Four million. Higher, lower? Twenty million a month. Twenty million a month. But this isn't account for. These are just the devices. They don't account for how many jewel pods are actually. Um, so it doesn't factor that in. Also, there are a lot of knockoffs. So there are other companies who are seeing the demand and trying to put out these other compatible cartridges or pods. Uh, how many of you give gift cards to nieces, nephews, your own children? So those of you who think that you, they can't get a jewel, we're finding out that more and more students are using their gift cards to go online, buy Jewel, and have it delivered to an Amazon box, like at Whole Foods, where they just go in, click in the number, pull out the pods, they're usually buying more than one, and then going to school and selling them. So we have a lot of students who are now becoming very entrepreneurial drug dealers. I want to ask a really silly question and throw it out there. As someone who's a little ignorant, I have to say, I don't quite know what a Jewel actually is. Jewel actually what? Is it Jewel? That is like a device that the young people buy and then they go and then they pack this with some kind of a... a yeah, thing. and he's going to go through that in detail. I'm just giving you a little overview at this point. Yeah, I'm going to go through the basics of looking at the device and understanding all the parts of it so you can recognize it. I have this theory that Jewel has trackers on their devices mm -hmm. and that okay. they may be knowing where they're concentrated around schools or anywhere like that. And this is information that they're probably withholding from the public. So this is one of my like, I don't trust the industry or these companies and these devices are so smart and I'm wondering if they're collecting that. It, it makes it hard for us researchers to look at that, but um, I'm really skeptical, so. And the reason we're talking about that is they started to offer to some schools, we can tell you where kids are jeweling at this moment. And our issue is, if our refrigerators talk to us and our coffee makers talk to us, what else does Jewel yeah. know about these devices? Yeah. Karen, you want to add something? Well, just quickly, um, for the sake of the videotape, can you repeat the questions? Oh, I'm sorry, good, thank you. Okay, so uh, that was a good question, I forget what. <laughs> okay, so I'll do it from now. So uh, some of you re may remember that Coca-Cola used to come in and uh, go to high school and say, boy, your football field's really kind of a dump. You need a new scoreboard. And Coca-Cola will buy you a new scoreboard. We'll put it in for free. Now we'd like to put an ad on it. Oh, and we'd like you to put in a machine that will sell Coca-Cola products. And oh, at halftime in all of your events, those will be Coca-Cola only products. Now, even before Coke did that, Gillette used to do that. You know you used to get a Gillette razor for free? Free! You know why? Because only the Gillette blades fit the Gillette. So it was a way of creating customers. So Jewel at one point said, you know what? We'll come into the schools, we'll give you $20,000. Do you have $20,000 to spare in your program? Not for drugs. Not for drugs. <laughs> They come in to the school and they would educate. Now, I said it's like putting the fox in the chicken hen, and the millennial over here said, I, I don't get that, what do you mean the fox in the I started laughing when I heard that. <laughs> so the reason their particular prevention program didn't work is first of all, it blames kids and parents. It's their problem, it's not our problem. They stressed, uh, they didn't stress in the beginning. I, I, I don't know if some of you have followed the advertisement, but it's only been in the last six months or a year or so that they've even said it contains nicotine. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until people really got on their case and bad publicity and that sort of thing. Uh, there was no identification of Jewel's advertising and social media promotion. Jewel does not have to advertise that much. You know why? Because Jewel smokers advertise for them. Mm -hmm. They put it on their Facebook page, they put it uh, out in emails to each other, they show pictures of them jeweling, pictures of all the kids jeweling, etc. So they don't have to do a lot of advertising. It does not address the importance of flavors that Julie uses to become addicted, and we'll talk more about flavors in, in, in that. 
And this is out by Stan Gant, uh, Glance at UCSF, which is the tobacco depository for all the information from the tobacco companies. Yeah, and also, I just want to say this is, this is pretty sinister of them. Not that it hasn't been done before, but we were receiving a lot of requests from schools who were like, what do we do? We we're having this issue with these pod-based devices. And I think for them to prey on these schools and go up to them and say, hey, we'll help you. You know, we're talking about people who are desperate to have this information. So good thing we partnered with California Department of Education and they um, recommended that educators use our curriculum and turn away um, Jewel Labs from coming into their schools. Richard? Yeah. I just want to comment that that is a really important point, that this parent education program is professional and we know better. But if you're a school and somebody says to you, we're going to give you free education around vaping, they don't know better. And a lot of schools took them up on that offer. And we'll talk later, Richard will talk about this. The reason we dislike Jewel so much is they were actually stealing our materials and on their website using our materials. So we've had cease and desist and our lawyers talking to their lawyers and that sort of thing. Now, this one, uh, Richard came to me and said, oh, I have this really cool picture. And I said, oh, good. I said, Richard, do you know where that 64 comes from? He said, no, what do you mean? How many of you remember Crayola? Yes, thank you. See, Richard? It's been a long time. <laughs> you were a really cool Berkey, kid. Berkey ruined 64. me. <laughs> 64, not that little skimpy eight pack. That was so this is the uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars that schools were getting. It's been in the news a lot. If you haven't heard about it, well, you've been somewhere else. Okay, the implications: we need to regulate, restrict uh, flavored tobacco products. And just recently, the FDA has eliminated flavors from cigarettes, except for what? Joel. Menthol. Yeah. Okay. For two reasons. One is that the African-American community uses it overwhelmingly, menthol. And secondly, because menthol adds an element to nicotine and tobacco to make it even more addicting. Uh, misleading and appealing ads, we have to stop that this is not a product of cessation. We have to stop the discounts and promotions. Many kids can start this without any initial investment. And we have to also publish what the actual nicotine levels really are. And we'll talk, Richard will talk a little bit about the difference between what Jewel said and what is the reality of it. And we need comprehensive education. Everywhere we go now, people are saying, would you please come and talk to our parents? So parents are actually putting the pressure on the schools to deal with this topic even more so. Okay? So Richard's going to take you through what we call our 101, which is the basic introduction to pod vaping. And you'll go through that extensively, and then we'll uh, answer a lot of questions at the end. So you'll see right here that the title of this presentation, this is actually material slides from the Tobacco Prevention Toolkit. So you're actually going to see a sneak peek of some of the updates we've made, and we're hoping to release it this week. Now you'll see that it's Reinventing the Cigarette, that's what it's titled. And that's because, as Steven mentioned earlier, basically you're just coming up with a new delivery system for nicotine. And these devices, though, are packed with e-juice that's being aerosolized. They have a cocktail of chemicals that we really haven't studied. I mean, it's the Wild West right now. From that previous slide, you saw that there was no regulation around nicotine, that we're not controlling the flavors that they're releasing. And I'll walk you through some of the issues that we're experiencing with these pod-based devices, and I'll tell you why they're um, called that. So you'll see right here we have a Fix and Jewel device. And we've been talking extensively about Joel tonight. There are two parts right here. You have the device with the rechargeable battery, and then you have another portion that's referred to as a cartridge or pod. Hence the name, right? Pod-based systems. So here are your two parts. And you'll see that in the cartridges or pods that they're loaded with e-juice. There's kind of this like faint yellow color that you'll see on the slide. They come in a variety of flavors and colors that are enticing to young people. And from the studies that we've done, all the surveys um, that have taken place, it shows that young people are turned on to these flavors. A lot of the first time users report that they use one that contains some flavor, something fruity or sweet. Now, a lot of young people when surveyed by Truth Initiative, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, didn't, when they surveyed those young people that were using these devices, um, in particular Joel, they didn't know that there was nicotine to begin with. And that's what's really upsetting is that when we look at some of the early packaging, there was no labels, 
any big warning labels, even on the advertisements, stating that this was there was nicotine in here. And this isn't just your um, normal beginner's nicotine um, level. I'm going to show you how much nicotine is packed in some of these pods. That's a question. Yeah. Sir, I've often heard from kids that, oh, there are different kinds. There's some that have nicotine and others that don't. Good. Okay, so the question was, we hear a lot of young people say there are, there's e-juice with or without nicotine. So here's my concern around that. This is how I usually respond. There's not a lot of regulation with e-juice, right? So there's no one saying, okay, let's make sure that the amount you're reporting on there is correct. So there's a lot of mislabeling going on. So what happens is if you look at an e-juice and it claims to have zero, there may be tr traces of nicotine. And then if you look at some e-juices that say, oh, there's actually six milligrams or maybe more or less per milliliter. So my concern right now is that the government hasn't stepped in to regulate all of the nicotine content. And in the European Union, they actually have a set limit on how much nicotine can be loaded in some of these devices. And that's why Juul's not allowed in certain European countries. Israel actually decided not to have Juul in their country. And as you can imagine, it's probably for competitive reasons too, of companies who are, cigarette companies who are already there who don't want Juul coming in. But, oh yeah, do you have something to add to that? Um, one system that actually did not offer a, a nicotine free option. Yes, a lot of these pod based question. systems. So the question, thank you, Stephen, is whether Joel offers options with or without nicotine. So the question I answered before was referring to sort of the range or spectrum of e juices, but Joel in particular doesn't offer anything um, that is zero milligrams of nicotine. You're talking about either 3% or 5%, and I'll explain what that means. That's the weight of. Um, of nicotine per pod. So we'll walk through, walk you all through that. Can you go back to the image? Oh yeah, of course. So they, they count the your pods, you know, once it's a use and done, or is it refillable? Okay, so all, there's a slide on here, we'll actually explain how some of these are closed versus semi-closed devices. Um, what that means basically, what it translates into is that some of them are modifiable and others are not. A lot of the older generations of e-cigarettes focused on that, but these newer ones um, claim to be closed. But what we're worried about is that they're not safe, securely closed, that a lot of young people are messing with them, and that's where we're concerned, um, is that they're not, they may be loading their own items in there, their own e-juice, and as you can imagine, if someone's dripping e-juice into a pod or a cartridge, it can spill it on their skin, and your skin can absorb some of that nicotine. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. There's a slide coming up on it. Now what you're seeing right here is the blood nicotine content over time. So on the bottom, you'll see that this is time after first pup in minutes. So this is looking at how someone's blood nicotine content would change after just one pup from some of these um, items. So what we're seeing is that after um, at one pup of a cigarette, you can see that there's that initial spike in terms of nicotine. And then the nicotine salt is very close to that cigarette line. And in a lot of ways, I think this is a marketing ploy. If you were the company, this could benefit the argument you're making about, look, this is a great uh, device you could switch over to. We're, we're intended for adults. Look at this graph. We made nicotine salt that way, so that way you could switch over. But the only problem is when you're looking at some of these graphs, they're coming from Juul Labs. So that's why I'm very skeptical when I see this. But if you wanted to really make an argument here, they're just creating another device for nicotine delivery. And I'll walk you through how this nicotine's different. But what I want to point out about nicotine salt and Freebase is Freebase is the very early version of e-juice. So what you'll see is that this Freebase nicotine can sometimes have a harsh hit on the throat. And what the nicotine salt is doing is creating a less harsh hit on the throat. Now, how is that beneficial to the company? Well, they're loading these pods with more nicotine. So as you can imagine, if a young person is being exposed to some of this aerosol from the device, it may not be as harsh, and they may be turned on to this product. Mm -hmm. Yes, in where, the back. Where does uh, gum fit into that? Gum? Nicotine gum. In terms of, oh, this was, they didn't look specifically at uh, the nicotine gum, but I can tell you that it's significantly, well, I don't want to use significantly because we use that in um, the literature a lot, but what I can say is it's a lot lower from the content of some of these nicotine salts. So it's not illustrated on here, but um, we could talk more about it because I have a lot of views and thoughts about our cessation programs and how we're going to help young people get off some of these devices. 
So the question was about um, nicotine gum. Now, what I want to show you right here is looking at some of the older devices. So some of you may have seen adults use these ones right here. Um, they're easy to detect because they're so big, right? They're kind of um, clunky right here, and you'll notice that they have a lot of battery power. That's why they're so big, because they need to house those batteries. So what these older devices are doing is they're creating a large plume, our aerosol. Um, notice I'm not using the word vapor, because the industry uses vapor to give people the impression that it's just harmless water vapor. So I want to be very careful to not perpetuate their rhetoric of what they want us to believe about some of these products. But what you'll see is that the jewel right here, off to your left, is a salt-based nicotine. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the salt base, what that um, formula is made up of is they're using benzoic acid, which is a common food additive, but in this case, they're aerosolizing it. I'll tell you how they use some of their language on their website to kind of normalize some of the chemicals. But basically right here, you'll see that there's salt-based nicotine, and what that's doing is um, they're allowing someone who would take a hit of the aerosol to relieve a less, receive a less harsh um, hit on the throat. So that's kind of what's going on with this new formula. In a lot of ways, I think this is the direction these um, products are gonna go in using more salt-based nicotine, as opposed to the free-based nicotine. Now notice that this device is a lot smaller, it's discreet, but there's a lot less battery power in here. So what these companies have sort of done is they've realized, let's not heat it up so much, let's create a smaller aerosol or smaller plume. And what someone would do is if they were using that, it would make it harder for us adults to detect if a young person's using. So they basically have modified this to something that's creating a large plume, and now something that's creating a more faint plume. So that's what makes it so hard for us as adults to detect what a young person may be using. Now the next point right here is that in these pods, there's 0.7 milliliters, but the main point is that there's 41.3 milligrams of nicotine. If you took that same amount, 0.7 milliliters, and looked at some of the highest e-juice concentrations for these older devices, it would only be 25 milligrams of nicotine. So the salt-based, pod-based devices are changing the game because they're loading more nicotine into these pods or cartridges. And that's what has me, that's what has me concerned and a lot of researchers um, worried is because now they're introducing more nicotine. So there's a higher potential for addiction in these devices. Now notice how I said pods are um, not made to be refilled because the company claims that it's a truly closed system, but like I said, they're not securely, um, the way they're packaged, it's, it makes it easy for someone to mess around with it. And that's what worries me, is that they're going out saying, oh, it's closed, but it really isn't. And then lastly, this um, part is shifted a little to text, but this is focusing on being able to customize it. The whole idea with pod-based devices is you would be done with one pod and put in the next. Very different from these um, older versions where you actually have to put the Aegis in yourself. Oh yeah, I have a great slide to show you. So if we were to look at this um, you know, from a distance, you can see that some of this labeling is confusing to begin with. If I were to walk into a store and I would see this, to me this doesn't really shout in a lot of ways like, oh this is harmful, this is a tobacco or nicotine product. This is some of the early packaging, and I, I hate to say this, but a lot of the packaging hasn't changed. On Joel, you'll now see that there's a nicotine warning label that's bigger on the bottom. And then at the top over here, you have another device that's very similar to Joel, but this is called a Soren device. And it was one that Steven was pointing out earlier on our um, landscape slide that we had of all the different products. And then over here, you'll see the fix um, pods as well. It just doesn't really scream in any way of being harmful. and they've been able to get away with this because they're not being regulated like cigarette companies. And that's why it's been so easy for them to release the flavors and have this very big packaging. Now, here's a little fun fact. The creators of Joel, one of them used to work at Apple. So it shouldn't surprise you that um, some of their packaging is very similar to the white sleek appearance that we see with a lot of our iPhones and headphones and everyday tech products. And I know in the back I heard Sala Hand, was there something? You wanted to ask? I was just noticing that a lot of the packaging that I've seen, including the ones you have there, um, it's very feminine looking and very sleek looking, so it very, very much appeals to the females and the younger generation. 
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that point up. We'll talk about particular ads. Also, this bottom one, the fix, to me looks like makeup from a, from afar, right? It looks like cologne or perfume. So it's very big, and if we were to pass by this, we wouldn't see it as threatening to um, our youth, right, in any way. Now, one thing I like to emphasize with young people is that they want you to be confused. It benefits them if you can go and pick up a product and not think that there's any harms associated with it. And that's what we have to remind our young people is that they're taking advantage and they're trying to manipulate you. They want you to become addicted so you can become a lifelong consumer. And here are just some more critical questions to ask of how much is 5%, 5% um, strength of what? You'll see right here if you look closely, four pod, multi-pack, 5% strength. It doesn't say anything about nicotine. Mm -hmm. Now let's look a little, and this is what I've already mentioned about it being one pod is 41.3 milligrams of nicotine. Yeah. Nowhere on that packaging does it say contains nicotine. This is an older version, now it does. The question was um, about whether there's nowhere on here that mentions anything about nicotine, but now that has changed. This is what they initially came out with. And it makes sense of why young people wouldn't, when they did the surveys, why they didn't think there was any nicotine in here to begin with, because it doesn't really emphasize that in any way. 41.3 milligrams in one drill pod. And I know we're, we hear a lot of different numbers, but I think the best way to kind of capture um, the addictive potential is to look at this slide right here. So what you're gonna see is that in one pack of cigarettes, there's about 20 cigarettes, and you have to notice that the delivery system for nicotine is not as efficient. So what I mean by that is if someone's smoking or using a cigarette, some of that nicotine is not going to be absorbed in the body. Some of it's going to burn and it's not gonna go into the human body. So what you have to look at is that for each cigarette, let's just say there's only an absorption of one milligram of nicotine. So we can all agree that if there's 20 cigarettes and for each cigarette, one milligram of nicotine, what that then translates to is that 20 cigarettes should equal 20 milligrams of nicotine. So if you look at the very top, you'll see one pack of cigarettes is about 20 milligrams of nicotine. Now that first question we were asked when we were doing sort of the warm up was, one joule pod is equal to the amount of nicotine in a pack of cigarettes. Well, it's actually closer to 41 cigarettes. And if we were to look at how much is in a pack of cigarettes, that's actually closer to two packs of cigarettes. And I have tracked their language on their website, and they've gone back and forth. They've been very wishy-washy because they're realizing that researchers are catching on to the fact that this is actually, there's more nicotine than what they're reporting. And it's unfortunate that a lot of public health campaigns have been saying one pod it's, is equal to one pack of cigarettes, and we're hearing that, but then we're seeing something now. So the researchers, we've been able to go through, and we like to think of it as being closer to two packs of cigarettes. Yes? So how does the time that it takes you to use it up compare? Like, how long does a pod last? So the question is, how long does a pod pass? Uh, how long does a pod last? There are reported 200 puffs in a jewel pod. Um, for instance, and we don't have that data to know how fast a young person is going through some of these. When I was in Kentucky, there was one um, woman who was sharing with me that a parent was struggling with their child going through five pods in one day. And if we look at this, that's um, close to 10 packs of cigarettes in terms of nicotine potential. So we are truly in the Wild West, if you think about it. There's no one that thought about what's, what would happen if a lot of these young people were gonna start using these products. Did you have a question over here? I don't know if this necessarily relates to what's going on here, because Secondhand Smoke came out to know there's been great advertising about Secondhand Smoke and how it affects your loved ones, obviously with cigarettes. How will you cover, how a jewel pod will cover, is there Secondhand Smoke with that as well? Because it's not just your own body, so you bring up a good point. We've been really good in tobacco prevention and control. So the question was asking whether I would cover anything on secondhand smoke or how many of you have heard of thirdhand smoke from a show of hands? So thirdhand smoke is that next level of when the chemicals from an aerosol actually interact with the environment, the floor, your clothes. So the whole idea of someone's using a tobacco nicotine product some of that residue can be left behind and it can be harmful to our pets, to our um, younger siblings, anyone in our family, right? So I won't be spending that much time discussing that because the literature is still figuring out more around e-cigarettes. We know a lot about cigarettes, but we're still unraveling um, what particles or what harmful aerosol 
is um, how it's compromising our health. Yeah, Karen. So one thing I'd like to mention um, is that the refills, the nicotine refills, they call it, they call it e-juice, comes in these larger containers at times, and the poison control centers and pediatricians are finding toddlers coming in with nicotine toxicity and overdose because they think it's juice and they drink it. So that's something that you need to be really aware of and um, these these e-juice refills are extremely dangerous. So we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, the reason why that sometimes happens is because they mimic a lot of products that already exist. So there may be something that looks like Fruity Pebbles and then they kind of you know, mock or do a parody of that in an e-juice form. And then a young person or even a toddler, as Karen was pointing out, may mistake in it for um, something else and they may drink it. And then you have to call poison control and take them into the hospital. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that Dr. Karen Lee is on the advisory board of the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit. Yeah, we just met on Friday. <laughs> So this slide, to jump back into looking at some of these pods, it's scary when you think about the nicotine potential packed into these small pods. And what you'll see is that in a fixed pod, so this is just like a knockoff of a Juul, what Juul has done is commercialized e-cigarettes in a lot of ways. So we, you, we will say that name a lot, but that's because they've been leading the way in terms of sales, and they've been really concerning us because um, they were the, the ones that have sort of initiated this epidemic in a lot of ways. If you look at a fixed pod, the volume is doubled, so there's almost twice as much nicotine, but just in a fixed pod alone, there's about 75 cigarettes. So um, in terms of nicotine potential, that's the way you can think of it. Now, when I, uh, I'm doing the math here, you just begin to kind of do it yourself and think, okay, how many milligrams of nicotine are in these pods? That's gonna equal to the amount of cigarettes. So with this Soren pot, it's an even bigger volume, and it's actually closer to 90 cigarettes in terms of nicotine potential. And I think this slide really captures the concerns we have around young people becoming addicted and then not having any um, replacement therapies around nicotine to help them if they're trying to quit some of using some of these pods. Yes? On the... Oh, first in the front and then in the back. Yeah. Is the number of puffs in the pod so the as I mentioned the question was about the amount of puffs being equal to each other so as you can imagine we can think of it in this way if there are 200 puffs in a Joule pod and you're like doubling the volume so it's probably closer to 400 puffs and then if you double it even again it's gonna be about 600 puffs so you're increasing your amount of puffs for a lot of these devices they're increasing in volume so they're able to store a lot more nicotine salt e-juice. So that's what's going on here. That's why they um, are equivalent to more cigarettes as we go across the screen. Um, there was a question over here. You had mentioned that c cigarettes might allow the nicotine to escape. Is there any comparison on how efficient, how much more efficient the pods are in delivering nicotine? Well, my take on it is I think if you look at where we're at with nicotine delivery, I think e-cigarettes have improved it in a lot of ways. That's the whole um, idea is that, oh, we don't, we're not gonna lose a lot of our nicotine, so why don't we create these uh, very addictive formulas, like I was saying with the salt-based nicotine, of having a less harsh on, um, throat on the hit, or sorry, less um, harsh throat on the hit, Oh, sorry, <laughs> less um, harsh hit on the throat. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the, all of those factors going into it, they would want something that can deliver nicotine a lot better than a cigarette, which is why the tie, I titled it Reinventing the Cigarette. It's the same idea, just a little better. Now, if we were to discuss the brain, it's really important to know how nicotine is hijacking the brain and rewiring it and basically changing the structure of it. So what you see right here are two cells in the brain. Those are nerve cells, or you just think of them as brain cells. And basically, you'll see in the orange right here, I know it's a little difficult to see, but nicotine is binding to similar spots as acetylcholine. And the way I like to explain that to a young person is that this is what is sort of hijacking the brain. You have a foreign chemical coming in, and it's masking itself as something we already produce in our brain. And what it's doing is it's binding to those sites and it's giving a lot of young people this false shock. The brain is highly sensitive to these false shocks during brain development. 
And there's so many cool things that young people could do at this age with their brains. And a lot of pruning occurs. And for us, it may be more difficult for us to pick up a foreign language or learn a new skill. But for young people, this is actually a really cool time for them to do that. But what happens is if you have something like nicotine coming in and giving that brain a false shock, what it then does is it gives that young person the impression that they need nicotine. And that's why it's easier for a young person to become addicted. And if some of you aren't aware of this, nicotine does prime the brain for addiction in a lot of ways. So if you're already at high risk for that because of your family or um, your environment, then this is only gonna increase that chance that someone would maybe use other drugs other than nicotine. So there's a lot in the literature that shows that. If you were to look at this GIF right here, you would see that this animated picture basically shows um, termites. And that's the way I kind of like to think of nicotine for a young person, is that this nicotine is going into the brain and hijacking um, that structure. And we don't want the industry doing that. Besides rewiring and changing the brain, this is just nicotine too, by the way. It's kind of scary when you think about all the other chemicals, the cocktail chemicals that's in this aerosol. Nicotine is an upper, so what that means is it'll make your heart beat faster, and that's because you're in a fight or flight mode. So what that means is the body is excited and it's trying to respond to some stressful stimuli. The only problem is there's not some stressful stimuli. Nicotine is inducing that response. So as you can imagine, that puts a lot of stress on the heart. It's not good for your heart to be beating all the time and to be working that hard. Also, there can be trouble breathing and damage to the lungs from nicotine. Um, the lungs weren't made like the stomach. So if something leaks into your lungs from that e-juice, from the aerosol, as you can imagine, your lungs, they don't know how to handle those chemicals. They can't break them down like your stomach can and other parts of your body. And then this increased acid reflux. So that's also another side effect of um, someone being exposed to a lot of nicotine. Now what the industry isn't telling you and what Juul Labs hasn't been able to come out with is a statement on all the risks associated with these different parts. If you think about the mouthpiece and heating up some of these parts, we don't know what the long-term effects are, or even the short-term effects. So that's something that needs to be studied, but it's just unfortunate that this product was released before we even had that information, that the government was okay with releasing something like this. Now, if you were to talk to a young person, I always like to remind them that how are all these parts gonna affect your body? Because the company's not telling us that. And this not only applies to Juul, so this is a Juul device right here taken apart. This is actually um, something you can apply to all pod-based devices. Another way to be, um, have young people become motivated about this issue, because it's impacting them directly, is to look at how this, there's, there's so much waste um, being left behind with these pod-based devices. So now, when I'm walking through San Francisco, I start to see these a lot right next to the cigarette buds. So I'm concerned that this is gonna be the future, and I think we need to combat this issue so we don't have to deal with something like this. We're already struggling to deal with cigarette buds, and now we have to worry about this. Now, what I've talked about of being in a pod, this is what's listed um, from the company. We've already mentioned nicotine and how addictive it is and how it rewires and interferes with the brain development. Benzoic acid is in that nicotine salt formula. It's really key to um, creating a less harsh hit on the throat. And glycerol and propylene glycol are commonly found in a lot of e-juices. So those are main ingredients you'll see. And then also it becomes really vague right here. They list natural oils, extracts and flavors. And I like to draw these question marks because we don't know what else is in there. They're not telling us what's produced when these chemicals are aerosolized. So what I mean by aerosolized is you heat them up and what happens is you form very unstable molecules when you heat something up. So we don't know how those unstable molecules are acting on all parts of our body. Now this was a figure that Steven had gone over. There are over 20 million devices and pods sold every month. And I'm pretty sure that's increased. This is a very outdated number. But the point being is that all of these unknown chemicals, right, ones that we don't know how they affect the body when aerosolized, are being exposed in this great, at this great magnitude. So it's really scary once you start to tie together the number of how much is being sold with all the chemicals and even the chemicals we don't know about. If we were to isolate just one chemical, yes? Have they, you talked about the environmental effects, have they found any evidence that the chemicals in the e-juice cartridges that get left on the ground are getting in the water supply, in the public water supply? 
So the question was looking at any of the e-juice from these pod-based devices and whether they were contaminating the water supply. And this kind of goes back to our limitations around research. I don't think researchers have been able to study this in a great amount of detail. And if it is going on, there's nothing that's been published yet. So I think that's something we need to look into. And if we're gonna become involved and become activists around this issue, that's one thing to address is the environmental toxicity. If we were to look at benzoic acids, it's just one chemical alone for to isolate it. If inhaled, this is, these are the reported side effects. It could lead to irritation of the lungs, nose, and throat, but also coughing, shortness of breath, and even wheezing. That's that whole idea that some things like benzoic acid, they're a food additive, but that's eating it versus inhaling it. If you're inhaling this chemical, of course there are gonna be different side effects. Our body wasn't built to break down benzoic acid in our lungs. Also, if exposed to the skin, so if someone was dripping that e-juice and dropped on their skin, it would lead to cracking and drying. But the main takeaway from this slide is there's little research on the long-term effects. And this is just for one chemical, kind of the same thing about just looking at nicotine. We need to really isolate some of these chemicals like benzoic acid and think about all the harmful um, results that can come from it. Yeah? The coffee and wheezing can be confused with a cold, with somebody is actually using this a lot, or in high, uh, with high milligrams? Yeah, it's, that's a really good point. So. Um, the question was whether someone's symptoms of coughing or wheezing, how it can be mistaken for someone maybe being sick, but that's also an indicator of maybe someone using. And initially, if someone's using something with such a harsh amount of nicotine, uh, they may have that response. So we have to kind of use that as maybe a potential indicator. We don't know. It's always fair to be suspicious and think whether that device is being used in some capacity. Now the industry is aware of all of these different reasons why a young person may use. There are flavors, which we've been talking about, changing social norms, life stressors, and I like to give my spiel on young people are living in a very dynamic, interesting time where they're in the age of information. They have access to the internet. And the thing is, it's overwhelming. They're living in a time where maybe we can't relate to what they're going through how they socialize, their networks. It's not the same of how we used to do that. So we need to be mindful of that. Is that what may be contributing to their stress and anxiety? And they may resort to some of these devices to cope with that. So that's what I've heard from a lot of young people who are using these devices. Also, perceived reduced risk. When we're looking at that packaging, a young person may come across and think, oh, well, that's not harmful. I don't see anything about nicotine. And that's what has this concern, is that they initially started the problem with their um, very vague packaging. These last points on marketing and lack of addiction education. I think as a society, we don't discuss addiction enough in school and talk to young people about um, what that means. Yeah, Karen wanted to mention to the parents who don't yet have children in this district that we do have a neuroscience of addiction course that's delivered in every ninth grade um, life skills class. It's the first quarter of every um, ninth grade year and um, so they'll get that curriculum. When did that start? Uh, we started the pilot three years ago mm -hmm. so this next fall will be 4.0 but it's built. The first year we only rolled it out with a few teachers and now it's um, every teacher, every health teacher except two. Thank you, Karen. When we were doing our initial focus groups, we realized that that was something that was lacking. So it's always nice to hear that um, there are places and districts and organizations that are dealing with that, of there being a lack of addiction education. Now, we're going to focus on flavors, changing social norms, and marketing. And what you'll see is that there are these flavors for some of these pod-based devices, and the companies received a lot of pushback from the federal government, FDA, and if you were to count a lot of these flavors, you would see that there's five, uh, 15,500 tobacco flavors and counting. And you'll see from some of these names, Banana Bub, Booger Sugar, Barney Pebbles, Dragon's Blood, that they're marketing to a particular audience. When you're thinking about what's trendy and what appeals to a young person, the e-cigarette companies are going to take advantage and create these products that appeal to our young people. Also, San Francisco, we um, may have heard about this, but it was really exciting when they pushed their flavor ban. 
of um, not selling flavors in the city, and I'm hoping that's the direction we're gonna we go in. I know for a lot of local efforts that are occurring, that's probably what's gonna have to happen. I always tell audiences that we can't really hold our breath for the federal government. We can continue to um, encourage them to take some action, but it may occur locally before um, something happens federally. So let's just be aware of that. Joel has been quite successful with putting these flavors out and really appealing to young people and then making them limited and what this has done is created a demand from young people who are using these. But this is what I'm concerned about is that we're going into a direction where there are knockoffs that are compatible with the device, but they're trying to keep up with the fact that there's a demand for some of these flavors. For a young person, um, I think that they're just creating ways to make it easier to become addicted. You'll see right here that there are all sorts of different cartridges dedicated to being compatible with the device. All similar amounts of nicotine too. They're trying to mimic Joel and yeah. Under vitamin weight as well, which is how is that different from the nicotine? Vitamin <coughs> weight? What is that? Vitamin weight. Vitamin, vitamin weight, sorry. Oh, the the vitamin? Yeah. Uh so what's your question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so how, that looks exactly like these jewel pods, so how is that, um, how can you make a, who is using vitamin and who is using the jewel? I still am trying to understand your question, sorry. It definitely <laughs> caught me off guard. <laughs> so the uh, vitamin weight looks very the, much The like vitamin. Vitamin. Okay, weight. sorry. <laughs> very much like the jewel, uh, the pods. Yeah. So how can you tell who is using the nicotine and who is using the... So yeah, it's it, you're bringing up a really good point around us being able to detect whether something has nicotine or not. Um, my concern is there could be THC, there could be nicotine and THC. So whenever you see some of these pod-based devices, it's fair to assume that some of those ingredients are in there. We can't um, think that just because it, maybe if it doesn't contain nicotine that it's still safe to aerosolize some of this. So I'm glad you brought that up because um, we're having that problem in a lot of our schools where someone's caught with something and we don't know how to, from with the naked eye to detect if there's nicotine or not in there. It's always fair to assume that there's probably something similar to that in there. And even if a young person argues that's not what's in there, they shouldn't be aerosolizing any of these chemicals. Okay? Um, yeah, in the back. You might cover this later, but are there any um, reliable like home detection tests? <laughs> <laughs> so schools are hearing, there's like this market now of, oh, schools are struggling with this, so now we want to come out with a detector to put into bathrooms. And this is kind of similar to what you're asking about, whether there's something in homes. The problem is some of these aerosols are so faint, as I mentioned, they're doing lower battery power, or they're using lower battery power to aerosolize this e-juice. So even if we were to create something, um, I think the problem isn't to try to match what the companies are coming out with, but to think about ways of regulating like the aerosol they can produce and how much nicotine's in there. So but even so like a like a P test that you could give your teenager. You you can. There are uh, there are tests you can do to detect if someone's being exposed to nicotine. There are byproducts. Your body will break down that nicotine and it'll be it'll circulate in your body. So there are ways of doing that. I was thinking of um when you asked your question of aerosol detection. Yeah. Stephen, did you want to add something? <laughs> yes, I have to be mic'd first. Uh, I also think it's important to understand that this is going on in the classroom. And part of the appeal of Juul is the fact that it is so subtle and undetectable. So students are taking a rip off that, blowing it in their shirt. There's not this big plume like it used to be. So on YouTube, there, there's a piece of film that I particularly like where a student goes up behind the teacher who's working with students, gives the jewel sign, everyone in the class is laughing, the teacher kind of looks up, does it, goes back to work, takes a hit off it, blows it into a shirt, and the teacher doesn't notice. So I've been to schools now because uh, it's going on in the science room, under the science table, it's going on in the art room, in the different rooms they're having, it's going on in, in the rooms. It's now becoming a social activity, and also it's becoming, can I get away with it? That's the cool part. So yeah. it's becoming culturally appropriate now. Well, I think young people are also looking for their tribe, so you've introduced something where 
young people could identify with. And um, I know some of you have some really great questions. We're gonna hold off. I just wanna spend four more minutes going through these and then we'll um, save the last 10 minutes for questions, okay? So what you'll notice is that there are a lot of problematic memes. So what memes are, are basically taking an image, putting some um, content or words on there that kind of poke at maybe someone using. And uh, you'll see right here, you have someone in the desert walking towards jewel pods versus water, which is a quarter mile away, versus the 25 miles away of um, the jewel pods being located that far. And you have to remind people that this is problematic because this is how we're perpetuating the problem that young people think it's funny maybe that it's you're addicted to something and may not even see it as a problem of seeing oh nicotine's not a problem you know it's fine and we don't want that to happen we want to create a stigma against nicotine we want people to know that it's not normalized we're not going to make it like caffeine or anything like that but the point that Stephen brought up earlier was that these companies have the young people do the marketing for them it's so easy now they could just go on social media post a video and now a young person's been exposed to someone using and may view it as cool. Oh, Stephen, if you want to interject. This is, this is something that we ran across. <clears throat> this is the University of Miami, and this is their mascot with the pipe. The students on the campus said this is way too old school and suggested this. Mm -hmm. So this is now in the process of being voted on by the students at the university. This is how it's becoming socially acceptable. It's becoming a part of the culture. So the hardest thing to change and the hardest thing to fight is cultural acceptance of something that shouldn't be acceptable. And these are young adults too. It's not to say that our work ends in terms of uh, high school or middle school. We have to think about ways of um, supporting those young people who are being exposed to these products in college. If we were to look at these advertisements, what you'll see is that they're not intended for someone who you claim you want to quit cigarettes, you know, someone who's been using for 20 years. Obviously, these uh, advertisements, part of their initial campaign, oh, part of their initial campaign is really speaking to a um, young audience. And you'll see right here that there's a lot of problems with this ad of how the model looks and the language that's used and the colors. And then also there are other devices that are coming out with similar um, ads that are speaking to a lot of different group of people. Um, they're realizing that young people are vulnerable, we'll go to them and we'll um, you know, try to resonate with what they care about, what they find to be important. Now real quick, does anyone, can anyone tell me who this individual looks like? In the back? She looks like the gal from the, the shooting in um, Florida, the, woman, the young woman who got up and Right? Yeah, okay. so um, in the back there was a comment about the shooting in Florida, the Parkland activist um, known as Emma Gonzalez. And when we first saw this ad, we were, well, we weren't shocked because the industry is really smart about finding figures that may resonate with a young audience. And you see the language is like, is the baby been waiting for? We know that she's a figure around gun control and she's as an activist in that. And you're putting someone in there that may subconsciously resonate with the young person. They may not know it right away, but when you think about it, you're like, that person looks familiar. This feels right. It feels okay to read this message. So that's what um, has me concerned that they're piggybacking on other social issues that are going on and trying to make an argument for using their product. Here's, okay, a video that I don't have time to show, so I think we're gonna end by asking questions. Um, and I know some of you had some great questions, so if there's something that wasn't clear, let's spend the last 10 minutes doing that. Do you want to add something, Karen? I'm sorry, I don't allow enough time for questions. Um, I think that the Sequoia Healthcare District we put out a newsletter um, about vaping through the superintendent's letter. So if you go back to your email dated February 28th and then scroll all the way to the bottom, <laughs> that's where our new newsletter is. But it's, a, it's actually, we're quite proud of this newsletter and on page five, there's a one page PSA about the dangers of vaping. But the other part of the newsletter is actually as important, and that's how to have the conversation with your team. So not only what is it, but how do I talk to my, my child? How do I talk to my teenager? So look on page five of that superintendent's newsletter dated February 28th. 
And um, Javier Gutierrez will, if you have any questions, come to him and he'll be able to point you in the right direction. All right? And let's oh, say, first of all, oh, go ahead, Karen. Well, and one other thing, too, is, and, and this is pointed out in our newsletter, that when it comes to any kind of substance use, whether it be cannabis, you know, marijuana, um, vaping and nicotine, or other drugs or alcohol, always keep in mind about the mental health ramifications. Is there a reason why the child, the teen is using? And we need to address that and not just punish and take it away. But really consider what is the root of this? Why is that young person using? So we have to keep that in the forefront of every conversation. And we're going to take your questions, but let's start out by saying a really nice thank you to Stephen. So, questions. So we either covered it so great there's no questions or so bad, you, oh, there we go. Okay, we'll go here and then here and then here. Is there any regulation on advertising? I was just looking at the internet, just looking up something on Google with my son. There was a small little ad and what really shocked me was there was a one second little clip on the side. It was like a car ad and then all of a sudden there was a little vaping ad. Then it disappeared and went away, just embedded in this other ad on the side which I was very disturbed to see. This is where I like to show my age over the millennial. <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but when you used to go to the movie theaters in the 50s and 60s, all of a sudden, popcorn would be in the lower right-hand corner for about a second, and all of a sudden, everybody's getting up going to buy popcorn. Well, they found out that that subliminal messaging kind of thing was not fair, and they eliminated that. But this is the same kind of thing that's going on, is that image is the message. Okay. And they're seeing a lot of like Snapchat ads in between, so if you watch some of their um, videos that they like to share, there are ads that pop in. Um, so that's where we're like sort of like what I was saying in the Wild West, where the FDA needs to step in and think about um, wider regulation on that scale with ads online. So two questions, I want to piggyback on the, uh, what she just asked was, um, you know, there was a whole to-do about camel advertising and they used an animated camel uh, and that was considered illegal, I think under Obama, where they said no more advertising to young people, that was, you know, and of course camel was like, no, 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 we're not doing that, we're not doing that. But they prohibited that. So why does what is what do jewel products not fall under that same law? Well, part of the part of the reason is, and part of the reasons we're in the Wild West is it's taken the FDA years to determine who's in control of this. Is it the Department of Agriculture because it's a plant? Is it the FDA? Is it the CDC? Who's actually in control? I'll give you a good example. One department of the government is responsible for cheese pizza. Another is responsible for pepperoni pizza. Do you know the difference? Pepperoni. One's a dairy product, one's a meat product. And those fall under different departments. Could you, so you can imagine how difficult it is for where does the jewel fit. And that's why if you saw the latest FDA, the head of the FDA just resigned. If you read between the lines, part of it is over this issue. But the FDA issued that we might we could, perhaps in the future, the language was not really strong and clear. So there's been very few in that area. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that you're right. The Obama administration was successful in banning flavors of um, around cigarette products. So they, except for menthol, as we mentioned. But I think we're in a time where the products are evolving so quickly that even us researchers, we have to catch up. So you can only imagine or the government, is the federal government, and catching up with this issue. And we were down in Los Angeles, I'm, I'm gonna let them ask some questions, Karen. Uh, we were down in Los Angeles, and Richard and I found two new products that we had never seen before. And we've been researching this for six years. So there's already new products wow. being developed. The first question around the THC was, so you mentioned like you don't know what's in it, so are you finding that there's 
ostensibly nicotine products with THC in there. And then secondarily, with all of the, the, the changing, you know, regulation around THC, are they going to be interchangeable, the parts between? Their <laughs> short-term answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, whenever yeah, someone yeah, asks yeah, about e-cigarettes e and vaping, they always bring up marijuana yeah, because... Well, we can't the oh yeah, the question was just thinking about THC and nicotine, and like I said, you don't really know if what's in the e-juice, and the way I was hearing it was, um, you know, how are we going to handle that? Because I think when we're educating about e-cigarettes, we're going to have to talk about those other chemicals that are in there. It's not just this conversation about nicotine. There's a lot of intersection with nicotine and THC, and that's why we're coming out with a new toolkit on marijuana cannabis. So which we'll be yeah, working on that. May 15th. Yeah. The, the issue is also that he talked about closed and open. So even though it's closed, you can go on YouTube and figure out how to pop those off open them up, put in THC. So they're not really closed at this point. Yes. Um, so thank you for presenting tonight. I love that you are presenting from Stanford and the two founders from Juul are from, or Stanford grads. So I love the irony of that. I'm like, they don't, they, that pressure makes them uncomfortable. Um, hopefully. Um, so I have a question though on this, on the studies. Are there any current studies right now, especially um, with young people and the negative effects of um, Julian or the e Yes. I want to say something that uh, there is that myth. The, the question was, is there research about the use and effect on young people? Yeah, I get so excited when I want to answer it. But yeah, um, basically what we're finding out, Stan Glantz put out a statement on his blog and there was a um, research convention that went on in San Francisco and what they're finding is that in the studies of e-cigarettes and cigarettes so when we're answering that question the third one on whether there are less harms or less chemicals they're finding out that e-cigarettes are impacting some parts of the body that cigarettes don't so what that means it's like comparing apples and oranges because there may be a chemical from e-cigs that you're not exposed to in cigarettes if you're using both of them you can imagine your increased risk but my whole point is they're kind of different. So when we're thinking about it, I think we've been taught, oh, here are cigarettes, here are e-cigarettes. And us in tobacco prevention and control thought that. But now we're realizing we have to separate them. You can't really think of e-cigarettes being less harmful than cigarettes. And that's what the studies are showing. You had a question? Me? So yeah. three-fold yeah. question on this one. Oh, oh you, I'm sorry, you're asking somebody else? Let, let, let him ask and then I'll choose you. <laughs> you had suggested that the pods might be modifiable and, and added. Are pods sold with THC? Are pods sold with uh, THC? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. You can, you can buy pods. You can buy any, any, almost any way that cannabis comes, you can buy it. Yeah. Our biggest concern right now is edibles. Here's, well, here's some history though. Joel Labs used to be part of Pax Labs. So Pax Labs is a loose leaf vaporizer. So they were focusing on the marijuana market. So Joel Labs derived from that background of being part of a company that sold that. So as you can imagine, if you're coming out with devices that have nicotine in them, they're gonna be ones very similar that contain CHC. So that's what we're dealing with right now. And, and now, ma'am? Uh, sorry about that. So basically three four questions. The first one, if this particular product is, whatever the research has been done so far, is not concrete, then how this product can be even released to the public? Uh, first question. Asking about the, con let me ask one one. Uh, the concreteness of the research, is that? Exactly, because. Okay, one of the things I'd like you to look at is from the time cigarettes were introduced until the Surgeon General put it up, we know way more about pods than people did about cigarettes. So compress that history. We know a tremendous amount. What we're trying not to do is caught with, get caught with, well, we don't know this, and we don't know this, and we don't know this, so go ahead and use them. Where we really are is we know a heck of a lot. And if it's leading in that direction, it's not good. But it's also a problem that we have in our society. In Europe, they're a lot different about how they release a product. I think in the States, you're, it's easier to release a product and not go through all the risks and list them out. 
And that's why some companies, it's not just a problem that we're having with tobacco and nicotine. You can make the argument about other markets too. Uh, putting out these products, like for example, if we're talking about marijuana, they put out a lot of CBD oils and tinctures and they say, oh, there's this much CBD in there. Well, guess what? It's not regulated, so it's mislabeled, just like e-juice with nicotine. So the same thing's happening with a lot of these other companies are somehow getting away with it, but that's how we are, consumerism in this society. They allow for that, and I wish I could provide you with a better answer to why that occurs, but it's a systemic issue. You had a question. I, and, and just I want to say, I want to honor those of you who can stay until 8.30. Some of you have younger children. If you need to go now at 8.30, please do feel free. We're going to stay and answer a few more questions, okay? So go ahead and ask, uh, answer yeah, more. Yeah, I just want to make sure that people know we want to honor your time, and if you need to go Yeah, down, feel free. Fine. We've been walked out on a lot, so <laughs> don't worry about that. We're used to that. Go ahead. Jeff, can you, uh, like, direct us to this harmful effects of nicotine, period? Just like, can we direct you to the harmful effect? Yeah. Is there studies that say adolescent nicotine, bad things? Absolutely. Yeah, so... Remember when I mentioned about nicotine priming the brain for addiction? And what I think, nicotine is so addictive. And so if you think about it already being addictive and then introducing it to a brain that's vulnerable. So when I say a brain that's vulnerable, that's the developing brain of our young people. Um, if they're exposed to this, like I said, if they're given that false shock, um, they may be already be predisposed to addiction. So a lot of young people who use Juul to begin with, they may not um, like it because of how their brain chemistry is. They may say, oh, I don't really care for it. It doesn't really do much for me. But well, I don't know what that means. Like, are there like published studies? There say, are. There are yeah. studies in the literature that show that the brain brain is primed for addiction if using nicotine. Yeah. There, there, and it goes back to what I said before. There's tons of study. The, our toolkit has all been researched and re-verified by the doctors at Stanford and UC, uh, UCSF. So we know a lot. There's a tremendous amount of published, peer-evaluated uh, research out there. Through your, through your toolkit, that's where we find it. In our toolkit is the best place. Yeah. yeah. Was that really your question? Where do I find it? Yes. I'm sorry we oh, went on yeah. for 10 minutes and I could have just said that. <laughs> yes. My apologies. So this is fantastic. I'm just wondering, looking, say, at a high school with a big problem, you know, that has a big problem here, what would be, what are some steps that you would recommend we take? What are the most effective ways to try to change the culture and thinking, change the access to it, change the, um, you know, use some of the classroom? Like, what, what ways are thought to be most effective. I've heard sometimes. I, I, my, this is what I like to say. A lot of young people, like Karen was saying, there's an underlying mental health reason as to why they may be using already. So sometimes a young person just needs to talk to a trusted adult. They need someone who's checking in with them, um, looking at what's going on with their phone, um, taking a little more interest. I think it really starts, it's that easy sometimes, of just going out of your way to check in and say, hey, what went on? What did you see? What do you... And we have a lot of materials like that in the toolkit where um, you have conversation initiators. And I don't know if you want to add anything, Stephen, to that. Definitely. <laughs> uh, what Karen talked about, I think, is the most important, is this is not a punishment issue. This is really an issue of mental health, and so you have to start with this whole idea of why are they doing it. We're finding that our toolkit is being used a lot where students are being busted at school for youth. And rather than them just being punished, they are actually having to go through parts of the toolkit. So we believe that, that knowledge is power and that education is a part of this process. And what's in that education process is kind of some of the things that Karen's talking about. Yeah, and sorry, I, I, no, I, you like, know I like saying this. <laughs> question. So, uh, it's for you guys and for Karen. From an advocacy standpoint and policy standpoint, what can we as citizens do to help? I know Jerry Hill has been, you know, really far ahead. He was at, a, at, at our opening when we released the toolkit. So what else, what can we so do to... So our executive director, Bonnie Halpern Falscher, and she's the founder of the toolkit, is going to Sacramento next Wednesday. So I know that may be hard for some of you to go and attend, but there's going to be a hearing and we've been encouraged to spread that word. And if you're able to go, we have one of our youth advisory board members, she's going to go speak for two minutes, but if you can go and actually share your concerns, that's one thing that I can think of that you can do within the next two weeks. Um, Karen? We started a newsletter. Yeah, so I was for gonna 
we yeah, want that's, parents to take action? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the Senate Bill 38 and 39 are the two Senate bills you want to look up. And you can actually write letters to, to Senator Hill. Um, we're actually putting together letters now that are going to be um, summarized in his presentation. But there are seven legislators who are authoring these bills in California. So there is a huge groundswell of support, not just from Senator Jerry Hill, who's leading it, but six of his colleagues. So look up 3839, and then writing letters, emailing, all of that helps. And coming from all of you, it's even more powerful when and, there are many voices. And what they're looking at in the letters is basically it's, it's an analytical problem. They look, okay, we had 100 from parents, 20 from students, 50 from organizations, that sort of thing. So the more diverse it is, it really does make a difference, even if it's just counted. Okay, in the very back, and then we'll come this way. Uh, it's a simple question. I'm uh, just learning about this. How easy and where do teenagers usually get these things? Like, can they just go to the store and buy it, teenagers? Yes. And they're allowed? It's not illegal? It's no. Some, some <laughs> okay. cities are cracking down more than others, but you can access them like at gas stations. But I think the biggest problem we're having is curbing online sales. Um, of these products and that's what we need to really emphasize is that we need there to be more strict regu like regu regulation around online sales uh, we'll take these two questions and then we'll quit <laughs> what are the treatment options if this is addiction so I think we're at this point where some of our old nicotine replacement therapies are probably going to be outdated because as you saw from these pods that contain so much nicotine, I don't think we're equipped to um, deal with this higher tolerance um, of, to a nicotine addiction, and our higher tolerance of nicotine. So uh, I'm concerned because I don't think, even I can't tell you if there's an effective cessation program or intervention program. We know that a lot of brief intervention goes on for students who are caught, but we need to think about as a society um, how we're going to handle this because um, there's so many different components to this issue, and I don't know of an effective or quick cessation program that we can point our students in the and direction to of. put it in perspective, it's easier for you to kick heroin than it is nicotine. That'll put it in perspective for you. Question? No? No. Oh, and... I have one. Um, you? Okay. So Did you have a question? You have one. Okay. Okay, you go ahead. Um, well, I was wondering, what is the uh, number show IDs when they go into the store? So Just like they do for cigarettes and alcohol. Because I've been in the paper of the store on, a, on the Woodside Road twice, and both times I was in there, young kids came in and chatted them up and bought them. There was never any question about ID. Where they're getting busted a lot are the 7-Elevens and, and the gas stations. But again, as Richard was saying, it's still it, it's 21. But you have to. Here's where I'm like worried because when you go online, you just have to check to verify. Like, oh, are you over this age? And some of them are not updated to where our state standards are of 21. It's like, are you 18 or over? You just click a box, and that's the problem. Is that someone can go online and look at all these products, a young person, and be exposed to this. We'll stick around for a few minutes and answer questions, and we're going to release the rest of you. It's horrible to be talked to death. So thank you very much.